we are now live on YouTube. This is the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are scheduling some time this morning to um, to connect on uh, on what we've been working on and uh, to spend a little time planning for our next several weeks. Um, and so the first uh, the first thing that I wanted to uh, to go over with committee members. Um, uh, S-344 is coming over from the Senate. Um, that's the bill that we have already spent some time looking at, which would allow municipalities to, um, to change their tax rate by uh, act of the legislative body as opposed to uh, an act of the, the town as a whole at town meeting. Um, and it would also allow them to, uh, to uh, relieve some of the penalties and interest that might be ch typically charged for late payment of property taxes. And so uh, this morning at 1030, right about now, the House Ways and Means Committee is looking at the language in that bill uh, because they want to be sure that it's not um, going to have the effect of impacting uh, state education fund revenues. And so um, we we may get a recommendation from them, which is why I asked Rob if he would sit in with that meeting and uh, and report back to us if they are inclined to ask us to make any changes to what the Senate has done. Uh, JP, you've got your hand up. Is that because you have a question? No. Okay, Marcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to press the. Um, importance of acting quickly on this bill. I know from my town of Richmond, our next property taxes are due May 15th, mm, mm -hmm. which doesn't give uh, the towns a lot of time to decide how they might <coughs> act if we pass some legislation. Great, yep, good point. Uh, John, Gannon. Uh um, I've heard some rumblings of some opposition to S-344 um, from towns. And at least in one email I received yesterday evening, um, it, the LCT may be um, ginning up towns um, to oppose 344 because it doesn't go far enough um, with respect to the issues that towns are facing with having to pay the education property tax. Um, so I, I don't know what they're doing, but I mean, they definitely seem to be meeting with towns. And I mean, I think obviously I would like to see some relief for towns with respect to education property taxes. That's not gonna happen in this bill. That's not really in our jurisdiction, um, but it may be worth reaching out to Karen Horn and Gwen and just making sure that um, we're gonna have, not have a tough time on the floor. Um, mm. I, I do know that from talking to Jeanette that she had a tough time in all Senate caucus on the bill. Um, people I don't think really understood it um, or in its limitations. Mm. Tell me more about that. Uh, what, what about all the, Senate caucus? Yeah, was there pushback because senators had been hearing from their towns? Yeah, no, people didn't understand it. Um, you know, you know, and I didn't participate in the all Senate caucus, but I just heard that it was lengthy and, you know, there was that Jeanette had to spend a lot of time explaining the bill. Maybe um, Betsy Ann was there and can better explain it. I, I was not there. I'm not uh, handling that one. I don't have a lot of information to provide on this one. Um, that's Tucker's bill. So I apologize. I can't give any more info. And Tucker is with Ways and Means right now. Uh, uh, working on helping them uh, um, understand what the bill does. Uh, JP. So your hand is down, but you're still muted. Perfect. So apparently there's another option of the um, going through your uh, abatement process through your uh, Board of Civil Authority Board uh, um, abatement board, I guess it's called. In fact, we are looking at that, uh, which anybody that feels 
they need to can request a hearing before the abatement board and, and discuss their taxes that way. That that uh, I, I think that may call for several meetings of the abatement board, but I'm, I'm really not sure how, how many there would be. But there's another option in, as well, I understand, and that's, that's something we're researching anyway. But uh, I don't know, I just sort of add out. I think everybody knows about the abatement process, but. Mm -hmm. Jim. Yeah, I think, um, and I, got, I heard from one of my towns yesterday, the concern is, you know, this is all fine and good to delay tax deadlines or penalties, but the concern is they still got to pay the state education tax, which is the lion's share. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, so I, you know, as the bill has passed by the Senate, um, we may be given authority to the towns, but it really may be um, authority with really without authority because uh, they would open themselves up into a, a real pickle if they um, delay tax filings and then have to pay the state in the interim, which money they don't have. So um, I, I'm not sure what the answer is other than also delaying the state education payment. But if we do that, then it's gonna cause additional problems on the Ed Fund. So catch 22. Yeah. Yes, um, that is the challenge that we're in and the conversations that I've been a part of with um, with the chair of the education committee and the chair of ways and means, um, you know, both both of those two committees are uh, are well aware of the dangers and the threats that can be um, the, that the state could could have to endure if we all of a sudden create a scenario where um, where we inadvertently make it easier for people to delay payment of their property taxes. So. Um, I think that what the what I understand from the conversations with those other chairs is that uh, they just want to make sure that uh, that the town as the entity who's responsible for chasing down delinquent taxes um, is uh, is going to work just as diligently to collect those taxes as they uh, as they would in normal circumstances. Um, so that means not creating some sort of perverse incentive for towns to uh, to go easy on collecting taxes. Um, Jim, your hand is still up. Do you have something else you want to? I, I have sworn to stop putting people's hands down so that so that we don't have any of those mishaps on the floor. Uh, Hal and then Mike. Uh, thank you. Madam Chair, um, if I recall, the last time we heard from Karen Horn of VLCT, she was going to look into, um, with regards to the Senate, about what flexibility there might be for cities and towns to forward whatever they collect in terms of uh, those education um, funds and forward them accordingly versus being on the hook for the entire amount. So I don't know if it came of that conversation, but I do recall that. Yeah. Mike. Put my hand down first. Um, I, I represent three towns and one of the town managers I heard from is um, asking if whatever we can do to help school districts pass the budgets because they can't set a tax rate without that school budget. Now we, we have talked about voting by mail or where did I hear something about setting up drive drive by voting? Was that so the Secretary of State's office? Do for school? Yeah, I think but maybe Betsy Ann um, has been been keeping up on this as well, but the Secretary of State's office has uh, has issued some guidelines, some um, some options out there for uh, for municipalities who have outstanding votes that they need to have happen um, during COVID nineteen. So, Betsy Ann, do you have the ability to rattle off what some of those provisions were? 
I'm just going to see if I can pull up uh, the Secretary of State's guidance, um, but essentially they use the authority from the elections, the COVID related elections act that General Assembly enacted recently uh, to allow municipalities to use alternative methods of voting, including the drive up voting method, um, a collection of ballots outside of a polling place where people can just deposit their ballots um, outside and election officials go and collect them uh, to make it easier to perform these municipal meetings um, that do require a vote of the electorate. I'll see if I can find the uh, guidance from the Secretary of State's office and send it out to the committee. So I'm hopeful that that will help these um, remaining districts that that don't yet have um, don't yet have school budgets. Um, one other distinction. Oh, go ahead, JP. I seem to remember when we had a discussion a while back with uh, with some people from the elections uh, division of the Secretary of State's office that they were going to be paying the additional cost for mailing uh, ballots on these elections. Um, and now I, I could be mistaken on that, but I, I know they said that they were gonna be covering the additional cost. However, the, um, the guidelines and the directive that came out in the last couple of days from the Secretary of State's office uh, specifically stated that they were not going to be covering uh, costs such as postage for the local elections that it was going to be the town's responsibility. So right. maybe, yeah, maybe I was incorrect think, and I'm thinking it was both, but I guess maybe it's just the the um, the uh, general election in November because they did specify on the directive and the guidelines uh, in the last couple of days that it, the federal funds that they were going to receive would not pay the local taxes or excuse me the local uh expenses so it would be up to the municipality if they had just a local election to cover all and any uh, cost including the mailing that is correct um the the secretary of state's office has help america vote act money that they can use to um to help pay for mailing the ballots for the primary and general election um, because those are statewide elections and the, the local elections that need to happen by, um, by mail ballot will have to be um, paid for by the municipality themselves. Welcome, Rob. Hi, Madam Chair. How was your time in Ways and Means? I missed this committee immensely. <laughs> um, it, it was good. Are they are they done with their um, jog through and consideration of 344 at this point? Well, uh, for the most part, they are. They're obviously going through trying to figure out, um, as you can imagine, there's quite a, a fiscal hole that we're facing, um, depending on what math you're using. It's somewhere between 200 and 250 million dollars. So it was clearly more of a discussion around one, what that number is going to be, and two, what some of the potential uh, cures are to that problem, whether it be somehow finding new money, um, having a per parcel flat tax. It looks like we're in a neighborhood of about 22 to 23 cent tax increase to try to address that issue. So um, over and above the tax increases that we were going to have. So it was, I mean, it was a very good discussion but um, they're a long ways away from having any really proposed solutions on what, what to do. Uh, Warren. Hey. I was wondering, Rob, has there been any discussion about, uh, you know, Vermont has always had the reputation of living within our means and not, uh, borrowing money, but these are unusual times. And I just wondered whether they are considering indebtedness in one form or another, rather than a massive rate of tax increase to the citizenry all at once. Uh, um, we... That's, yeah, go ahead. That's a very, that's a very good question, Warren. And it, it did get mentioned 
as to whether that would be a potential solution that we would have to go borrow some of the money. Um, this, uh, the CARE package, the CARES Act here, it, it doesn't appear that they could use that money directly. So they're trying to figure out a, a workaround here on how that would play out. Um, so that, that is certainly in discussion, yeah. part of the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Marsha. So as far as the CARES Act money, I've also heard that states are getting back to the federal government and asking them if it can be used to fill tax holes. Um, so there may be a change there. But I have a question for Rob and um, just wondering what the discussion was on S-344 specifically. Uh, is there talk about separating out municipal taxes from education taxes? If you can tell us more about that, I'd appreciate it. Well, to be really honest with you, uh, when I got into the conversation and as long as I stayed in there, the, the con it's always been around what to do with the education fund. Um, I suspect based on the conversation that I heard that if they have a path forward, um, tentative path forward, that would in turn dictate on what they're going to do with the education fund money. You know, like for instance, like in Barrytown, um, we actually pay the schools directly quarterly. And uh, some other communities, it's my understanding might do it a bit differently. And part of this is also to figure out the yield rate. What number do they use? Whether they use the December 1st yield rate number that they had tentatively worked up or some sort of a new yield rate based on the reality of where we are today. So they, they did not get into the details of that, Marcia. All right, any other questions, thoughts, observations? All right, well, stay tuned because that will be a part of our next um, uh, consideration of a bill out of committee. Um, we, we have a joint meeting with Senate Government Operations scheduled for tomorrow. Did you all receive an invitation to that? It's a it's an extra a bonus committee meeting this week, right? Because you didn't get enough already. Um, but uh, the Secretary of State's office is going to do an update on their thinking with respect to elections, and um, and so I asked Jeanette if we could do that together, since it doesn't really make sense to have them come and say the same thing twice to two different committees. So. Um, so we will talk a bit about elections tomorrow. Um, Mike, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about what you were hoping we would also discuss at tomorrow afternoon's committee meeting? Um, and we can maybe talk as a, a group about uh, about how we want to proceed. Sure. Thanks. Uh, well, when we looked at uh, elections. Um, we, um, I, I had considered it adding an amendment to the bill that would, uh, the bill that is in place now, which precludes the use of having to gather signatures for a petition to become a candidate. And uh, I had considered a, an amendment to that, uh, which would limit the number of um, offices that any one individual could run for. Um, I withdrew that cognizant of we wanted to get that other bill passed and have something in place and hopefully we could discuss this at a later time and I, I still would like to discuss that idea uh, that at least during the time where these emergency considerations are in place that we we um, we limit the number of offices that somebody could run run for. Um, I'm, I'm not ready to, I understand there might be limited support for that and I'm not ready to stand in the way of any bill, but I would like to go on record for this. Uh, I would like to at least put a, put a flag in the ground to say that we're watching 
and, and maybe some discussion or an amendment that then gets withdrawn. Um, but I'd like to hear what the committee has to say too, if we have, we have some time for that. So I think that um, let's, let's have a little round of um, thoughts, observations, suggestions from the committee. And then I think I'll ask Betsy Ann if she can update us on other conversations that have been happening um, around this issue since we talked about it several weeks ago. So I've got Jim, Rob, and then Warren. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I agree with um, Mike's kind of view on that. I mean, I think if you're gonna run for office, you should pick the office that you really are interested in, not do a, you know, a staggered approach. Um, and I appreciate some of the concerns that have been raised um, from a constitutional standpoint. Um, although I th thought um, Representative Mawicki's amendment might have addressed some of that. Um, I don't know, I just think you, you should pick your medicine, pick the office that you really want and not try to confuse voters by getting yourself listed on multiple um, ballots. I, I know we had a candidate for statewide office last year, last election. And I remember people coming out of the uh, voting um, booth asking me when they were, came back outside and said, who is this guy He's running for five offices or something? And you know it was embarrassing in some respect. So I, I just think pick with what you want to do, and whether we can do it or not do it. You know, I, I guess I, I, I would like to learn more about that. But that's just where I am. I so I would be supportive if we can do it. Okay, Warren. Well, I, I agreed with Mike uh, when this was first raised, and I believe Jim agreed with him at that time. So. I'm still with that group. I, it, it, it's silly, you know. I think I think if we put some sort of a limit on it, maybe say no more than three offices, I I'd, I'd be willing to accept even that as a partial. But I'd, I'd prefer to have them pick one office and run hard to win it. That's it. But I'll I'll support whatever limits we can come up with. Great, uh, Bob Hooper. Um. I would assume we're talking about offices that conflict, like you could run for sheriff and run for governor and still be legitimate. I wonder, Betsy Ann, in your synopsis, if you look at uh, different branches of government being exclusionary or inclusionary or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it seems like it's, uh, you know, you can't run for several administration offices, but I would find being treasurer and being a state rep to be kind of weird, but I don't necessarily know how they would bar. Thank you. Etsy Han, go ahead. Hi, uh, just in regard to that issue, there is an incompatible offices uh, section in the Vermont constitution. It's chapter two, section 54 entitled incompatible offices. And it lists the office that a person cannot hold at the same time. And that list is governor, lieutenant governor, justice of the Supreme Court, treasurer, senator, house member, um, and sheriff. So just as you were saying, Representative Hooper, a person cannot be a house rep and treasurer at the same time. Now we do have case law, at least on that section, that makes clear that it's holding the office at the same time. It's not a prohibition on running for the office at the same yeah. time. It's just that under that case law, if a person were elected to two incompatible offices, they would have to choose which one they wanted to hold because they could not hold two at the same time. So like uh, state, state's attorney or something like that's far enough down the list that State's attorney is not an incompatible office. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, Chair, Chair, sorry. <laughs> I'm using my iPad here, so I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I, I do agree with what 
Mike's concerns are, and it doesn't make sense. I can't believe that the founding fathers would have envisioned anybody running for more than one office. Um, but it is my understanding, isn't it, that they've shortened that up to a two week window to hopefully try to limit that. Is that my understanding? And that should help the problem some, shouldn't it? That's Ann, go ahead. Yes, that was in your COVID elections bill. Um, on the one side, it said no candidate needs to file to collect any voter signatures because under the current law, otherwise a person, depending on the office, has to collect between 30 and 1,000 signatures, depending on which office you run for. So in that elections bill, that COVID elections bill that you enacted, um, the signature requirement was eliminated. But just as you were saying, Rep. Claire, then it also shortened the period to file candidate consents to about a two week period um, in light of eliminating that signature requirement. Um, so I, I believe it is what mid-May, starting um, sometime in mid-May where those candidate consents will be due. Um, and it is a two week period to file candidate consents. Uh, right now, uh, that bill does not place any limit on the number of candidate consents that could be filed. Um, Rep. Nowicki's amendment that you discussed um, would have said that a person could not file a candidate consent for more than one office in either the primary or general election, um, but that a person could still win by write-in. Um, for example, if they did file a candidate consent for Office X, but they won um, as a write-in candidate for Office Y, they could win that Office Y by write-in. You good, Thank Rob? You. I'm good, thank you. All right, Jim. So just in response to that, I think the Secretary of State's office after the last election cycle, uh, prior to that, you could do one petition, get your 500 signatures, and then you could enter as many offices as you wanted, which is exactly what happened. Um, so I think they were planning this time to change so that you had to do a different petition for each office, which obviously made it much harder. So if your intent was to run for five offices, you had to get 500 signatures times five. Uh, and people would know exactly what you were running for when you did that. Um, I don't think the two week window this time is necessarily uh, a deterrent to putting your name on multiple places because you're gonna do them all at the same time. It's the same form um, and you just change the office that you're running for, the disclosure, everything else is the same. So um, we've shortened it, but the reality is um, I think we've made it much easier to run for multiple offices. And you know, again, I, I, I would support some kind of limitation as long as, you know, they weren't, uh, if they were conflicting offices and that state's attorney, I mean, we used to have a state senator who was also a state's attorney at the same time because where he came from, it was a part-time position. And I don't think, I think that was fine. Um, but should I put my name on the ballot for state rep and for state senator this this go around uh, because I can. Uh, I don't think that serves the interests of the voters when they're trying to make a decision. Well, what does this candidate really, really want? So that's just my two cents. I'll shut up. All right. So Betsy Ann, why don't you fill us in on what um, what new information you have about this issue? Okay. Uh, just before I do, real quick. You, the General Assembly did um, add 17 BSA section 2353B2 last year to say that a single petition shall contain only one office for which a person seeks to be a candidate so that a person had to file separate uh, petitions for multiple offices. But that's under the current law that uh, requires all the signature collecting of voters. Um, so you did address that. But here in the 2020 elections, under the COVID elections legislation, a person can just submit, um, all, all a person needs to do is submit a candidate consent. So they could file a candidate consent, a separate candidate consent for each office that they want to run for. Um, when this 
uh, idea of prohibiting a person from filing more than one candidate consent was raised during your deliberation of the COVID elections bill. I just did raise the concern about whether this was constitutionally permissible um, because it's never been done in Vermont before. There's never been a prohibition on um, filing a petition or candidate consent for more than one office. So it was unchartered um, territory on how our Vermont Supreme Court would view that. The question is, on the one hand, whether it's an unconstitutional attempt to add a qualification for office, being that you're not running for any other office, or whether on the other hand, it is a permissible regulation of what's called ballot access. And states can um, have ballot access restrictions, such as the requirement to um, gather a certain number of signatures and file them by a certain date. Um, I just raised it since we didn't know, since we've never had this scenario here in the state. Um, and at the, at the time I couldn't tell you, and I, I still can't tell you with certainty whether it is constitutionally permissible. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the AG's office is, would, is aware of this issue or the, this proposal, because if it were enacted in the law, um, that'd be the office that would need to defend any challenges to it. So you should definitely hear testimony from the AG's office if you do wanna pursue um, the idea of prohibiting a person from filing a candidate consent for more than one office. I've been in touch with them um, just so they're aware of this and I can't speak for them as I understand it. Um, if I'm um, accurately uh, passing on to you what I am aware of, I don't think that they have the same concerns that it is, um, that it, that it is unconstitutional as I, as I understand it. You should hear directly from them. Um, it seems that it would be permissible ballot access regulation, but I'd highly suggest that you hear from them directly on this issue since they would be the entity that would need to defend the law if it were enacted. And the court, I just note, our, our Vermont Supreme Court does, um, at least from some of the language in their case law, does appear to um, have a view of wanting to protect access to the ballot so that people can have access to the ballot. But again, um, we don't know for sure what they'd say. And also it's a very, um, the way that Rep. Merlicki's amendment was drafted, it was limited just to the 2020 elections during this time where there's not a voter uh, signature requirement. So um, if the court, if it, even if the court did have concerns, perhaps um, they would uh, consider that these unusual circumstances, because essentially a person just needs to file a consent to have his or her name printed on the ballot. Right, and given that we're um, we're looking at mailing ballots, you know, it, in an ideal world, we we wouldn't have to mail a 17-page ballot because so many people decided they wanted to run for everything because there's nothing stopping them from that. Um, I've got Warren with a hand up and Bob Hooper, your hand is up still. Did you want to say something again? Yeah, I wanted, uh, we're drawing a distinction between conflicting office and others in this conversation, right? Uh, the, the way that Rep. Merwicki's amendment was drafted, um, it, it, it didn't make the distinction. It was just that a person would not be permitted to file more than one candidate consent for any office, regardless of whether the constitution considers it an incompatible office. Yeah, I'd be a hundred percent in favor of conflicting. I don't know about the rest of it. So I wonder how that would work if I decided that I wanted to run for governor and run for state rep at the same time. Um, I'm turning my state rep petition into the district clerk's office. Where am I turning my governor's petition into? And who would be the one to know whether I had filed for more than one office? Uh, for state and congressional offices that gets filed with the secretary of state's office, um, for a legislative office, it's with your um, either the senatorial district clerk or the representative district clerk. Hmm. Okay, so that could be that could be functionally challenging um, if petitions or candidate consent forms are are heading to two different entities, and somebody has to 
Somebody has to make the call. Uh, Warren, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I very much agree with Mike on the idea of limiting the number of offices. From a very practical standpoint, I believe petitions can be turned in starting tomorrow and have to be turned in by the 14th. That's a very narrow window for us being able to actually do anything about this. And I think Mike pretty much recognized that saying he wasn't going to make too big an issue out of this right now. I think this is something that we should look at in the future, but what would we do if somebody shows up at their, at their representative district clerk's office tomorrow uh, with petitions for several other offices and maybe turns in more at the senatorial district office and with the secretary of state. And then 12 days from now, we actually enact something that says they can't do that. Well, they were doing something that was perfectly legal when they did it. And what do we do then? That's going to tie it up well through the election period. So well, I, I, I don't see any, I don't see any real value in jumping on a bandwagon to pursue this right now. I just, I don't see it working out well. Betsy Ann. I'm just going back to your, the COVID elections act, which is act number two or 92, pardon, in section two, subsection B, the primary petitions uh, for major party candidates cannot be filed any earlier than the second Thursday after the first Monday in May, and that's Thursday, May 14th. So uh, candidate consents can't start uh, being filed until May 14th. So there is that amount of time from now until May 14th to enact legislation to put a limit on the number of candidate consents if you choose to pursue that. Go ahead, Warren. Well, they, so they can't be turned in until the 14th? That's correct. Um, they must be turned in by when? The 28th. Ah, okay. I had my two week period sort of shifted there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, the point is well taken that, um, that, that we are fast approaching the time when it would be too late to, um, to enact a change like this. Um, I think it would have to be pretty well agreed upon by both the House and the Senate and pretty well greased in order for it to make its way through the process. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to make a stab at it if the committee wishes to go that way. Jim? Would it be worth uh, raising that tomorrow in our joint meeting? Um, you're, I, you're absolutely right. It would have to be done real quickly. Um, it could be too late already, um, but it would be interesting to see if they have broad support for it um, in the Senate. If they don't, then, then it's probably a mute point um, and maybe we have to let it go. Uh, but I, I think it's worth raising the question. Marsha? In my mind, running for office is a serious consideration. And somehow when someone runs for five offices, it trivializes that in a way. I don't think the candidate should have a, let's throw it up against the wall and see what sticks kind of attitude. So um, I, I support this. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to bring it up tomorrow when we're all together um, and see how it goes. If you, uh, if you have a relationship with any of the Senate members of government operations, I would highly recommend that you have an initial conversation between now and tomorrow at one o'clock um, in order to see if you can uh, encourage some open-mindedness on the part of your favorite Senator. Jim. Yeah, just to, not to belabor it, but I would agree with Representative Hooper that it should be spelled out in compatible offices. Uh, and if they're not incompatible, then yes, you can do that because there are gonna be offices like, I think JP is on the uh, Justice uh, of the Peace is on in the fall. Some of us may be JPs right now, so. I think that has to be spelled out if we do it. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so does the committee want to pursue um, finalizing some language to present to the Senate tomorrow? Um, we can just do a straw poll with that. So if you want to give me a virtual thumbs up or an actual thumbs up or a thumbs down if you do not want to, and I can't see JP and um, Rob has gone back to, all right, Nelson's got a virtual thumbs up. All right. Um, Rob has gone back to sit in and listen to the Ways and Means Committee. So he's uh, he's got his video off because he's uh, he's doing two things at once. JP's got a thumbs up as well. Great. OK, so um, let's work on that language. And Betsy, Ann, does, do we need to make some tweaks to that language in order to reflect what Jim was just suggesting about the incompatible? Yes, is the, is the committee's position to have this prohibition only apply to the constitutionally incompatible offices? It's up to you, committee. Mike's Mike's wavering. Mike, go ahead and uh, and and unmute yourself and give us a pitch one way or the other. No, I, I, I'm good with that. But what Bob, what Representative Huber said made sense to me, so I'm good with that qualification. All right. Anybody else have a strong feeling on that? Go ahead, Bob. Well, just to emphasize, I think it also draws less flies from constitutional challenge when you narrow it to something like that. And I could be completely and totally ignorant of that process. <laughs> All right, Betsy Ann, do you have any other questions for us about, uh, about what we're looking to propose? Is it okay if I discuss the potential language with the Secretary of State's office? I always find it's good to run it by them to make sure it'll work from an administrative perspective. The Director of Elections is really good at pointing out some potential tweaks to help uh, strengthen the language administratively. Great. Thank you. Mike? Should we copy the AG's office on it too? Or is that well. premature? Well, the AG's office will need to weigh in on it um, if we get to the point of moving it forward. Um, but probably for the for the first blush, go around with it. It's um, it's really critical to have the language uh, reviewed by an elections administrator so that they know whether whether there's pitfalls there that we could solve with some tweaks to the language. Um, uh, Betsy, and do you have a connection at the AG's office? Yes. So would you share that after you've um, talked with the Director of Elections? Would you share that with the AG's office just so that they can be giving some thought to, um, to how they would weigh in on it? And we will uh, we'll see if we have more work to do on it going forward. Great. Any other questions on that topic? All right, seeing none. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit in our committee discussion today about um, about other bills that we might uh, we might consider working on during this legislative session. And the Senate had um, had neared completion on a on a couple of OPR related bills. And I just wanted to draw your attention to them and invite you to take a peek at, uh, at where those bills were left off because some of them I think um, do have, um, you know, an, a compelling need to be passed at this point. Um, in particular, the nurse compact bill that that uh, is a priority for the nursing board and also uh, could help with uh, the administering of uh, healthcare services by telehealth during the emergency. So that is S-125. Um, S-220 is the, is the more typical um, annual OPR bill and uh, there are uh, there are many parts of it that would be helpful, I think, um, moving out of the COVID shutdown. 
Uh, there are a couple parts of it that perhaps uh, we might want to ditch in light of the fact that we are, um, are all on a stay at home order for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I think I would like to suggest that we uh, hear from the uh, director of OPR to help us understand which parts of that bill uh, make sense and which parts of the bill uh, perhaps could be set aside until next year. So that's S220, I believe. And then there's uh, S233, and I don't recall where that bill um, left off. Betsy Ann, do you recall where that bill left off? Seems like an eternity ago. Um, I believe that Senate GovOps voted out S233 with an amendment. Um, just looking it up. That's uniform licensing standards, yes. Um, so I believe they did vote that out and that applies to professions across multiple professional regulatory entities to, um, so that they would have more uniform processes in professional regulation. Um, and I believe that did get voted out yeah. either at the beginning of March or uh, maybe end of February. No, it was mid-March. It was um, shortly before um, the state house shut down. Yeah. So that bill, um, I think, would also be um, a compelling one to pass because it creates a sort of a fast track licensure for people who are moving into the state from somewhere else. So it's of particular benefit to, um, to military uh, personnel and military families, to new Americans who may come with um, professional credentials from another country and might might be able to practice to the fullest extent here in Vermont if they had a, a more of a fast track to licensure. Um, this is part of a, a multi-state process that has been facilitated by NCSL for a number of years and, um, and the Secretary of State's office uh, had uh, had us attend a conference um, the, uh, last October, I guess it was, um, seems like years ago at this point, um, to learn more about how fast tracking licensure can be a benefit to uh, folks moving back and forth between states. Uh, John Gannon. Um, so I was just looking, all three of those bills are in Senate finance right now. Um, so I'm just wondering if they're going to get out of Senate finance so that the, you know, there's a full Senate vote on them and they, you know, come over to the house. Um, I, I would hate to do a lot of work on all those bills if they're just going to get stuck in finance. So there have been ongoing conversations uh, um, that I understand are happening between the House and the Senate about just what is COVID related and what is not COVID related. Uh, the way the speaker has asked chairs in the House to look at things though is, you know, yes, prioritize your COVID response bills, you know, so the elections bills and the municipal uh, bills that we've been working on are directly emergency related, but uh, but the next step is to think about what do we need coming out of this COVID shutdown in order to um, in order to help our economy and our neighbors rebound from this. Um, and I think anything that we do that um, that helps facilitate licensure for different professions is is in many ways a, an economic development economic stimulus. Uh, kind of bill. And so um, I don't know at what point the the Senate will will decide to give a green light to things that aren't directly COVID emergency related and instead start forward thinking about um, about things that can help us when we come out of this. Um, but these are bills that I think um, legitimately should be uh, should be on that list of things that we move um, before we adjourn for the for the biennium. So that's why I bring it up. 
Um, uh, are there other are there other pieces of work either that that we voted out of our committee or that you understood the Senate was working on that you feel there is a compelling case to be made that we should uh, prioritize passage? Uh, Jeanette has asked me a couple of different times whether uh, whether any of the things that we sent them are priorities. So we've had a few conversations about that, but I did want to make sure that you all knew if you had a strong feeling about a bill that we had passed that hasn't yet made it all the way through the process that uh, now is the time to make that pitch. So Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. I just, um, the, the charter issues, we're, we've gotten a couple. I know there's a couple others coming. I, I don't know that um, they're priorities, but they may be for those individual towns. Uh, and I don't know if we should schedule a meeting sometime to hear from the respective representatives to make their case. Um, a couple of them are local option taxes. Obviously, um, you know, budgets are going to be tight at all levels, and probably some are looking at a renewed interest in local options. So, um, those those bills would have to go to Ways and Means anyhow. So. Um, I just raised that as to whether or not we want to put it on our radar uh, and hear from sponsors. Yeah. Yes, I think we should probably do that. So um, we should work with Andrea to get a list of who the reps are who would like to be um, included. Um, we should probably invite all of them, but hopefully towns that have multiple reps don't uh, don't need to have each rep <laughs> speak at all on the same issue. But yeah, I'm happy to happy to schedule a day on charters next week. Uh, John Gannon. Yeah, no, I've heard from um, Representative Christensen about the Perkinsville um, charter. Um, yep. She would like to see that move forward. Yep, and that's one that is already over in the Senate. And, yeah, uh, and it's just dissolving the village of Perkinsville. It's pretty straightforward, but I, I think it's important. If I recall correctly, she's she's on the the Perkinsville Village Council or something, and she's That's dissolving herself. <laughs> <laughs> she's trying to shed parts of her job description. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I um, I think we can get some work on that set up for next week. And we'll also um, work on finishing our consideration of 344 next week. Um, Rob, are you back with us now? I am, Madam Chair, temporarily. Um, uh, because of the, the good work that the very talented and hardworking Government Operations Committee has done and continues to do. Um, Miko, sorry, that was my dog. Um, I don't anticipate we, they'd spent some time obviously talking about that as far as what the language meant. Um, one of the questions was, does this give the legislative body some powers that say the voters don't have, meaning as far as uh, addressing the tax rates and the penalties and it, it does in that the voters could give themselves that power, but they'd have to hold a special election to do that. But it's very clear that it only goes to the end of the calendar year. So I don't anticipate it um, based on the conversations that I've heard and they're continuing to have there being much concern about that. The one question that has been floating around out there that, and I know it was with our committee as well, is the education monies that are collected and how, what happens there. You know, if the, the legislative body makes the decision that they can't pay the school district, who borrows the money to make the school district whole? Does the school district borrow the money? Does the municipal body borrow the money to make the school district whole? And uh, I know each community is going to handle this differently as far as the tax rates or the, the collection of taxes is some are maybe going to push back the collection of the taxes. Some like us in Barry Town are going to look for them to be on the date that they're due, but then have the uh, Board of Abatement go back through and address any penalties and interest immediately after on a case by case basis. 
So I think that that's it, Madam Chair. Great. Does anybody have questions for Rob about what he has heard in um, Ways and Means? Excellent. I'm going to duck Great. back in there. Okay, thanks for doing that and uh, let us know what you learn. All right, so we are um, coming to the close of our time here this morning. Um, does anybody have uh, any other questions or comments or requests for um, for different issues to be elevated in the coming weeks? All right. Not seeing you all jumping all at once, but Alexa is reading something off to the side. So I'm going to give Alexa a moment. <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Um, I don't know if this is uh, accessible to Andrea, but if we could get an updated list of of what we've been working on, it's, you know, my my brain is a little fuzzy with everything else that's going on. That would be helpful for me. So a list of bills that are out of our committee or a list of bills that, what, what, what specifically are you looking for? Um, I think the, what's, what's on the wall, I don't know that we're gonna start something fresh, but it would just be helpful for me to just get a sense of what's on the wall still. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, and, and especially what's come over from the Senate. Almost nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> they they had uh, they had a slew of probably three to five bills that they were um, set to pass right under the wire of crossover, and um, and they didn't get them across. Uh, John Gannon. So just to to sort of answer Mike's question, if you, you go to our, our committee page um, and look at bills, you can actually find bills that are in our committee and also bills that are out of our committee. Um, so you can get a list of what's in our committee and also what's out of our committee. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have actually get a lot of work done, um, compar especially compared to the Senate, um, which is very frustrating. I mean, that they waited it until the very end to pass out bills and because of what happened with COVID-19 didn't get anything done. Um, yeah, I mean, you no, know, I agree with Jim, we should look at these charters. There's a lot of charters that got passed and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's desperately in need of work, but I'll keep looking. Um, so I believe that our committee meetings for next week are the same time blocks that we had this week. Um, I think that that's what I understand. And uh, we've, there have been several chairs who have asked if we could please start scheduling our own times and not have to abide by the master schedule. But, um, but that is still a request that is being processed at this point. So for next week, um, I believe that means that we have only three hours of scheduled committee time, two hours on Tuesday and one hour on Thursday. Um, Tuesday, we will need to dedicate to passing out bills that we can be, then be moving on the floor on Wednesday and Friday of next week. So, um, so we should probably plan to spend the hour next Thursday, I think, working on charter related issues, um, since th those are not necessarily urgent to, to get to the floor ASAP. Does that sound like a plan? All right, I think that's all for today. And um, I hope that you all have a lovely weekend. It's supposed to warm up a little bit, um, maybe. It'd be nice. You have a full house, eh? I do, yes. Yeah, my, my two yeah. younger daughters came home and, um, and my middle daughter's boyfriend came with them. And so we've been pretty much holed up and we're gonna Going to spend two weeks in relative quarantine, and um, and then probably the middle daughter will go back to California. She's uh, she's a little stressed though because she has no 
money and no job prospects and she's about to graduate from college so <laughs> which when she'll have no graduation ceremony of course but um but she's a little stressed about what life looks like when you graduate from college into a pandemic <laughs> welcome to adulthood if i were her i'd stay in school but i don't want to tell her that because then i'll have to pay for it <laughs> all right uh anything else that folks would like to bring up before we sign off uh madam chair they took a ned uh head nod straw poll and it was okay. unanimous to support the excellent work that the committee has done all right Our so committee. no red flags there good nope. deal all right super so i will see you all tomorrow afternoon with senate government operations won't that be fun oh gosh <laughs> Thank you.